and welcome to the November edition of this month. In this segment, we'll be reviewing the results of this momentous 2014 election here in California. I'll be your host for this episode, Stick Statistician Stan. With us now is Stick Senator Sarah, our expert in political issues, Hello. as well as Stick Sheriff Sam, our legal expert. Howdy. Senator Sarah, what are your initial thoughts on this election? Well, I think this election was a huge win for our gerrymandering process. Taking a look at the results for U.S. Congress, State Assembly, and the State Senate, currently only four incumbents out of over 110 running weren't re-elected. That's not even counting all of the other state positions, governor, lieutenant governor, even the Board of Equalization. This was a great election for those of us who were already in office. That's interesting. I also noticed that we didn't have a single candidate elected that didn't belong to either the Republican or Democratic parties. Is that normal? That's right. In the last 20 years, we've only had five people elected to the legislature who weren't either a Democrat or Republican, and technically three of them were Democrats when they were first elected. Well, now I'm confused. Didn't California recently pass propositions to change these trends? I know Propositions 11 and 20 gave the job of drawing new congressional districts to an independent commission, and Proposition 14 was supposed to give voters a greater say in primary elections. Right, right. About that, see, technically the commission isn't entirely independent. Turns out selecting people randomly from a pool of hand-picked people still gives you a group of hand-picked people. Since 10 of the 14 people on the commission are required to be either Democrats or Republicans, you still are going to end up with lines that haven't changed so drastically that the two parties won't still be favored to win the election, especially when the commission is still considering comments from the public when making the lines. You can see in the data, only 8 districts out of all the 173 Assembly, Senate, and Congressional districts even switched parties. Yes, and I see that more of those switches were from Democrat to Republican which was the general trend of this election throughout the United States. Do you think that the recent scandals involving California state senators played a role in that as well? With the corruption scandal involving state senator Leland Yee. A local state senator is on defense and the wrong side of the law. The state senator Ron Calder on corruption charges. Current Democratic senator from Montebello is charged in a 24-count felony indictment, alleging he traded political influence for cash bribes and jobs for his children. Not really. Only two of the districts that had scandals were up for election this year, and only one of those switched control. Well, what about Proposition 14? Wasn't that supposed to help deal with this two-party monopoly? All Proposition 14 really did was limit the number of people running in November elections to only two, rather than one from each political party. You probably noticed that in the elections for each district, there were only seven districts that had a candidate who wasn't either a Republican or a Democrat. I imagine having a voter turnout of only 40% helps solidify the incumbents as well. I notice that less than half of 58 counties had a voter turnout of more than 50% of registered voters. Indeed, everyone was expecting a low turnout this year in California, but we managed to rival the lowest voter turnout on record. Are you going to be trying to implement programs to increase voter turnout in the future? Only for people who vote either Democrat or Republican, it's great for us, since it's great job security. Our typical salaries range from ninety dollars to $100,000 a year, and we definitely don't want to risk giving that up by getting people out to vote who won't re-elect us. Wow, so you make almost twice as much as the average Californian. That is a pretty decent income. Oh, that's nothing. You should see what we pay our staff in Sacramento. Wow, who's this Eric guy who makes over $140,000 a year? We can't win if we don't remember the good things we you do. You see, there's three ways you win elections. You win elections by scaring people, us, and make thousands and thousands of phone calls. Wait, a guy you pay as a chief consultant is also the chair of the Los Angeles County Democratic Party. I imagine a lot of people must try to apply to a position like that. What a coincidence that it happens to be the guy in charge of getting people to go out and vote for Democrats in the largest local Democrat party in the U.S. Not really. We have plenty of others from the Democratic caucus too, as well as people paid even more from the Republican caucus. Sheriff Sam, is that even legal? It seems like a bit of a conflict of interest to me, hiring people to work for the state who may be more motivated to build their political party than actually serve the needs of the state. Leo, it's completely legal. And it makes perfect sense too. 
who better to hire to advise you than the person whose job it is to get you elected. Instead of you paying them out of your own pocket, you can pay them using state funds. You can even hire people who lost in an election to work in Sacramento anyway. There just aren't significant legal restrictions on who the legislature can hire once they were elected. Well, why don't we turn to our financial expert, stick stock broker Steve. Steve, what can you tell us about the campaign spending in this election nationwide? Yes, this was an amazing election for political spending. Estimates put the total spending at as much as $4 billion, which makes this the most expensive midterm election we've ever had. So, who is giving all this money? That's one of the best parts of this, I don't actually have to tell you. Since Congress hasn't passed any significant campaign finance restrictions, we can keep many of the donors completely secret in this election. A corporation or an individual can give to a C4 and nobody gets to know that they did it. Get one. And that money can be used for politics. Um, lawyers often form uh, Delaware corporations. So there's some anonymous shell corporation? Right. To file the papers with the IRS in uh, May 2013. So I could get money for my C4, use that for political purposes, and nobody knows anything about it till six months after the election. That's right. And even then, they won't know who your donors are. That's my kind of campaign <laughs> finance restriction. <laughs> Can I somehow give the money to myself and thereby hide it forever from all eyes and use it in the way that I wish? Actually, you can. I know it. But we do have at least some idea of who our top most influential millionaires are. You can see here, they've each given money ranging from tens to even hundreds of millions of dollars to different campaigns and political advertisements. Wait, Donald Trump, he still does things? Yep, he's amazing. It says here he contributed to Mitch McConnell's campaign for Senate, saying he had a chance of becoming the new Speaker of the House, even though Speaker of the House is a position in the House and not the Senate. Sarah, he does know the House and Senate are two different things, right? I'm not really sure. We try not to think about what goes on in Donald Trump's head. You're fired. You're fired. My suit. You're a dashing man. I know it. All right. Well, let's turn to the outcome of the propositions and to our legal expert, Sheriff Sam. I see here that propositions 1, 2, and 47 all passed. What can we expect to see happen as a result? Well... Proposition 1 will result in an increase in state expenses of a few hundred million a year over the next few decades, as we start borrowing the money for various water-based projects. So, will this mark the end of our water problems in California? Definitely not. The magnitude of this spending is nowhere close to the amount we'd need to develop long-term solutions to our water shortages, and there is certainly nothing we could spend money on in the short term. If we don't get higher rainfall in the next year, or negotiate some new deals with neighboring states, we'll see even more cuts to water availability. Now, our state spending has gone up by over $11 billion from last year's budget. Steve, couldn't we have directed a little of that spending to some of these problems instead of borrowing money? Well, the advantage of using bond funds is you can spend a larger amount in the short term, without sacrificing the other areas you want to spend money on. Since construction projects can only be completed if you know you have the money set aside to do them, your only option is to save or borrow the money. Borrowing means you don't have to decrease your spending right now, so politicians prefer it. So Sam, what can you tell us about Proposition 2? With Proposition 2 passing, our new cap on our state budget reserve fund will be 10% of general fund revenue. We'll also increase our state savings during years when the economy is strong, and possibly increase the rate we pay down our state debts. Probably the only significant change in the proposition is a new cap on the money schools are allowed to save in their own reserve fund. Our education expert, school teacher Sue, can tell us a little more. Thanks Sam. The biggest objection to Proposition 2 has been a cap imposed on school reserve fund. Schools have unanimously complained against it because this cap would force schools to lower the reserves they normally keep for years when school funding is cut. As you can see from these graphs, state spending for schools is quite unreliable and this proposition will only make schools less secure. Didn't anyone object to this when it was being put into the proposition? 
Unfortunately, this part was put into the proposition at the last minute, without any discussion or public comment. By the time the public became aware, it was already finalized. Can we reverse this cap? Oh yes. Before the November election, Play B 146 was already written to remove the cap put in by this proposition, so schools wouldn't have to decrease their savings. It's a very short, simple bill. You have the latest version of the bill amended August 18th, there. Yes, it is pretty simple. Is the state legislature receptive to the bill? Definitely. Here are some arguments on the Senate floor back in August requesting that the bill be given to the Education Committee for review and public comment. I rise to request AB 146, which is currently in Senate Rules Committee, to be referred to Senate Education Committee is for that policy Is that 3% hearing. but is insufficient to protect uh, our programs and That's staff. contrary to everything Brown so they're has not stood have for. Any money left if, if so this reserve goes levels through. are very important. Also for our rating agencies. The last-minute inclusion in the budget goes counter to our efforts to the promote local control. The cap on reserve control. levels limits school districts to just po quite possibly days of cash flow and uh, payroll. This is the right thing to do. Uh, please the support The legislature this should undo this mischief the first chance this it gets. This is an enormous Let's policy issue. Let's fix this now and repeal the cap on local reserves. Republican, Democrat, every district in the state. Talk to your superintendent. This was the biggest issue in the education bill. I've asked in rules. I've followed the policy to ask in rules to let this bill out of committee. Other bills are being let out. This bill. So I is respectfully not being ask read. and urge us to approve this waiver and allow AB 146 to just simply be considered in um, Senate Education. This is clear will. cut. Send this to the Education Committee. Let us have a discussion about it and let them weigh in where they should, right the policy committee. So the bill has been given to the education committee for review then? Well, actually. No, Roth? No, Steinberg? No, no Torres? No, Vidak? Wait, the Senate actually voted no? Why in the world would they vote no? There was one argument given against the bill. This is a proverbial mountain out of a molehill. There mole is hill. no Near term but I think a better threat. course of action is for those who are concerned about the policy to introduce a bill next year to make this a lead issue in next year's budget and next year's education budget. So, the one argument against giving the bill to the committee that would be most qualified to comment on it was that technically we didn't need to pass it right away. Right, and unless the Senate gives the bill to the education committee, they can't review it. But why can't the committee review it anyway? Because they don't have it. The Senate Rules Committee has it. But I have it right here, in my hand. Don't they have the internet in the Senate? Sorry, that's not how we do things in the Senate. What do you do in the Senate then? Well, here's what we were doing right before we discussed the AB 146 issue. I think I've got the resolution here. This country stands or falls on the political involvement of its students. Every one of you who has a child is going to be faced with your kid saying something to you that's never before been said ever. How could you have abandoned us like this? You have a responsibility to the America of the future. Thank you. Members, we'll take a couple of minutes for those who, uh, for those who wish to offer personal greetings to Mr. Dreyfus. We'll resume momentarily. You're joking right before you voted not to let the Education Committee to review a bill that would help our schools. You were posing for pictures with an actor who just gave a speech on the importance of education. We love irony in the Senate. Sue, anything you'd like to add? Hopefully we can get the legislature to repeal this before it takes effect. Until then, we'll just hope the time bomb doesn't go off. Thanks, Sue. Lastly, Sam. Why don't you finish things up by telling us a little about Proposition 47? I understand we'll be setting a lot of inmates free because of this proposition? Well, probably not. With a total CDCR population of over 185,000 inmates, at most only a few thousand would be affected by these changes. Anyone who was sentenced for petty theft or drug possession as a felony might have their sentences reduced unless they have a previous conviction for a serious or violent felony, or if the judge is convinced that the convict poses a serious threat to the public. For the most part, 
Anyone who fits that description has already had their sentence reduced to try to address the massive prison overpopulation problem California has been facing. In general, the sentencing mandate in the proposition was already the practice of most district attorneys anyway. Well, we were told that the state might save some money from this initiative. Will we see that money going to fund crime prevention programs? Probably not. Realistically, there's no way to reliably calculate savings, as you would have to know what our prison and court expenses would have been without it. Since district attorneys usually followed these guidelines when prosecuting criminals anyway, there's no number you can really compare with to calculate savings. If it were me, I'd just make up some arbitrary method and pretend that the number I calculate from it is our state savings. A lot of the state spending on crime prevention programs is fungible anyway, so any savings are just going to be spent on whatever the state wants anyway. So, possibly at most a 1-2% to decrease in state prison population, and no guarantee that we'll see any improvement in crime prevention programs? Well, not necessarily a decrease in prison population. After all, Reducing the sentence of someone serving 10 years for several counts of petty theft can still leave them in prison for several years, but over time we might see a gradual decrease in prison population as convicts are released a few years earlier. Prisons and county jails are overcrowded anyway, and they've already been releasing inmates as early as possible. This might accelerate that a bit, putting more convicts into county jails pushing people in county jails out into community supervision, and a few people being released from supervision early. Thanks, Sam. Well, I think that's all the time we have for our session this month. I hope you found it useful, and with any luck, we'll be back soon to talk about more important topics.